There's a 911 call, this, the brave, I, I'm going to keep using that word, brave 17-year-old who was able to escape and call 911 and led to the uh, arrest and the prosecution of David and Louise Turpin. Now, and we were talking about during the break, at least as I'm listening to it, if, if someone asked me when the last time I showered and my answer was a year, it would be, like, I would be, it's been a year, I'd be shouting it, it'd be crazy because to me that sounds ridiculous, but... This person almost says it like, yeah, I think it's been like a year since I've taken a shower. Joseph, we'll start with you first. When someone's describing the harshness of the reality and such and comes almost a calm and just like, this is how it is, what does that tell you about the treatment that they faced in that home? That that's, that that's the reality that they're, that they're accustomed to. Um, you know, we, we lead these, these lives that we have that are dictated by society that we're surrounded by keep in mind the only society that they had was what was contained within this residential prison in which they existed where they're actually witnessing siblings that are being chained up in the event that they are misbehaving so that is their reality we there's no way to those two things don't compute for us so the fact that she reacted in the manner in which she did is not necessarily surprising and and, and joseph to you could that be a part of the calculus as well? Because oftentimes we talk about sentencing. Sentencing is often about the, the single act that this person committed and how to harm that, def that victim at yep. that time. But now well, their act is actually going to affect them. So to me, maybe they should be in jail for 25 years because, and, and, and even more, because for the next 25 years, the harm that they instilled in these children is still happening. Is, is that something the judge can consider? I hope he does, uh, Brian, because let me, let me just run down some of the physical things that these children are faced with going forward throughout their life. Uh, first off, and at just, just so the folks at home understand, you're talking about kids that are going to have problems, dental problems for the rest of their life. They'll have uh, carious dentition where the teeth will rot. They'll fall out of their head. Can you imagine not being able to chew food now that you've got food? Uh, they're going to have muscle problems developmentally. They'll perpetually be weak. There'll be mineral problems relative to bone strength. You'll have joint problems where they'll develop things like arthritis. This can even impact your cardiorespiratory uh, system. And in the long run, this can lead to problems, say, down the road like dementia. So this is what these kids are faced with as a result, as a result of the decisions that their parents slash caretakers chose to do with their lives early on. And this, this is going to go to the heart. I hope that the judge makes a point of that. I hope that someone has at least whispered in their ear to tell them what the long-term impact is. Yeah, and then you have to couple that with the emotional and psychological trauma that these children are going through. They're going to, they're going to wear this mark for the rest of their life. There is no way to get around it. I mean, we're, we're still having cameras in, in the courtroom, and, and, and Joseph and Imram, I'm so happy for your input. And I, I only hope and I pray that that your comments are, are ideas that come up for the prosecutor and are truly said and passed on to that of the judge. But as we wait, we're going to step into break and hopefully come back and see more from this Turpin case. Welcome back. So we're still here covering the Turpin case, a, a tragic case of the abuse of 13 children. And as you can see in the courtroom, I believe counsel is seated on both sides of the table. We actually have live tweets from the Riverside County DA's office saying the sentencing hearing of David and Louise Turpin should begin shortly. Uh, so we're all waiting with abated breath. During the break, uh, like I said, we always have interesting conversations here. We love to bring them to the forefront to our, to our viewers. Uh, Imran and I were talking about there being always two sides to a story. And, and oftentimes, a defense attorney, you have to bring out that story for your client. But, uh, and I'm going to throw this to you first, Joseph. When there is no story here to tell, or maybe not one that you believe a, a, a judge or jury might, might accept, what is it that you think can be brought out to, because you're, you're a defense attorney, you have to help. You have to help mitigate the circumstances. What do you think, Joseph, that we can hear that might do that here? You know, I, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Uh, sometimes they say silence is golden. Uh, you know, the, the less said, the better. Uh, in many cases, I think that I don't know that there are enough offerings of contrition uh, that these two subjects could offer up that would, you know, have someone want to extend, you know, uh, any modicum of mercy uh, to to these two. Uh, it would be very, very difficult. I think there'd be an uphill battle uh, for the for the defense okay. uh, if they try to go too far down this rabbit hole. No. Uh, 
to yeah. excuse behavior. Now, Joseph, sorry to cut you off because I'm, I'm hearing now that there's some action going on in the court, so I want to go directly to the court to see what's going on. So there you have it. Both David and Louise Turpin are found guilty. Now, we here at Law of Crime are trying to, to make the calculations and the numbers, but we're looking directly to the tweet from the Riverside County DA's office, and the long and short of it is that both were sentenced by the judge to 25 years to life, which was previously agreed to by the office. Uh, first to you, Joseph. I, I, I know that we were all feverishly writing this down as the judge was uh, reciting all the counts. Is this what we expected? Yeah, yeah, it, it is, I think. Uh, and as far as the numbers go, it, yeah, it, it doesn't, uh, it, it's not a surprise. Um, I, I think that uh, the only surprise here, uh, if there is really any, um, uh, were uh, the responses of the children. And uh, it's, again, a very unusual environment to be in when you're in the same room with the people that have done this to you. Um, and we'll see how this plays out in the end, how this impacts their life going down range. But the sentences themselves are not a surprise. Yeah, exactly. And, and then just for that, we didn't see any of the children. Um, if a child was there, I think Joseph was there at the beginning and the camera was down. Obviously, the judge had made the decision to not show their faces because putting them in the limelight would only exacerbate any kind of harm. Uh, would, the, would the parents fully agree? Uh, when they spoke, I didn't hear a, I've now learned what it means to be a parent. I know what that duty, what that honor is to provide to a child, and I fell short, and I'm sorry. All it was is, I hope they go to college, I hope they do well. I, I, I didn't see it. Like, Joseph, I, I almost want to ask, what did the defense attorney say to the defendants when it came to drafting this document? And, and Joseph, where do you think the defense attorney might have fallen short in, in giving those instructions? Uh, I think it comes back to, to, to the word, seminal word here is contrition, and there was none. But if, if you would permit me to jump back just for a second relative to uh, the impact statement of that one man, that one young man, and forgive me, I don't know if it was Joshua or not, we couldn't see his face, this sort of thing. But the thing that was that really impacted me in what he said, and this is going to ring in my ears all weekend, is he said, I finally learned how to ride a bike. And he's making his way now. He, he, and he just enjoys going for long bike rides. Can you imagine being locked up in this prison that your parents have put you in, and all of a sudden you have the freedom of the wind blowing through your hair. You can feel it across your skin. Now he's... He's working on a, a bachelor's degree in software engineering. Sometimes, sometimes success is great revenge, I think. And to hear, to hear what he's doing with his life, and it's, it's absolutely the opposite of the life that his parents had, had assigned him to, is it not? Uh, this idea that you'll be put away in a hole, we're going to forget about you, we're not going to feed you appropriately. You know, even one child, I, I think, talked about how they're learning about proper nutrition. And, uh, you know, things like that are they're so very basic. I think that there was a lot of underlying impact that rested here, aside from all of the embroidery of, you know, I've forgiven you, you know, God forgives you, I hope we can stay in touch. There was this kind of linear thing that goes through this thread that runs through the whole thing. Absolutely. And, and I'm glad you touched on that specific uh, testimony. I think we actually have, we're going to replay again, the impact statement, I think from that individual, at least the first one, uh, let's listen to it now. Joseph, I think, I think you bring to light a great thing that in a story of such tragedy and harm, there's, there's this great, I don't want to say great, but there's this line of there's a child who made it out and hopefully there's a great future ahead of them. But when I listen to it as well as you did, and I agree with your point, there's almost a bit of anger in me that says they deprived them of so many years of having that before that they should not have learned to ride a bike now or cook for themselves now. That should have been done decades ago for some of these children. Uh, how, how do you think that might have resonated, uh, Joseph? Well, I think on one hand, uh, we have these children that have escaped with their life uh, and what remains of their life. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about psychological trauma uh, that they're going to deal with for the rest of their life. And, and uh, I even mentioned uh, the physical maladies that, that they might in encounter along the way. And at the end of the day, um, it is truly the only life that they have. 
Um, and, and I believe that, you know, just us as humans, we want to hear, going back to the defendants, we want to hear them say, you know, uh, this is why I did this. Here, here's why I did it, you know, and, and just try to make sense of it. But, you know, one of the most dangerous questions as an investigator I found myself asking, and it'll, it'll lead to just uh, a, a, a terrible end at the end of the day, is the question of why, because that's the answer that we never we never do get an answer to. That's the question we never get an answer to. That's why in forensics it's so great just to be able to say how and what and where and when and those sorts of things. Why is the most difficult question to answer? Exactly. And unfortunately, you might not ever get that why, but we hope that uh, the sentence might be uh, some form of justice. Now, I'm not sure, but I think I'm hearing rumors that there might be a press conference afterwards. You might hear some more from the prosecution as well as the defense after the sentence is done, but you'll only be able to hear it if you come back to Law and Crime Trial Network.